Good day and welcome to my presentation, uh, which is entitled Fostering Family Resilience, a Community Participatory Action Research Perspective. Uh, my name is Dr. Serena Isaacs and I am a Senior Lecturer and Research Psychologist at the University of the Western Cape in the Department of Psychology. Um, and so I present to you today just some of my thoughts and reflections on a process that I started a few years ago, namely my PhD, and just some of the lessons um, that I have learned in what is important in community development and what is important in fostering or building family resilience from a community um, action perspective. So the aim of this presentation is to describe some of the processes undertaken during the development of the program, which I came to call the Family Resilience Strengthening Program. Um, and then I'm also going to discuss some of the key lessons learned, um, often as a result of things that you don't often think about while you are actually in the process. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm going to discuss some of those, those lessons as well. So just to give you some background and context and rationale to the study. Um, so individuals together often make up a family unit and this can be defined in um, however you define your family, wherever you consider your family. And all of these families live in different communities and make up the society that we live in. And so as a system, individuals, families affect communities, society, and the effect moves in the other direction as well. And so we know theoretically um, from the literature, from what we've experienced is that families can be a good source of mediation they can also be a source of risk um, as well. And so I've had to reflect on then, what is a family's responsibility? Um, and so family's responsibility is really is providing safe and healthy spaces for the development of its people. And so creating a sense of belonging, providing adequate nutrition, safety, support, education, and providing well-adjusted um, individuals to society. So families, you know, given all this responsibility as families, we all experience increasingly unprecedented, look at 2020, um, unprecedented multifaceted challenges. Um, and these challenges often affect our ability to function well. So, as families affect communities, so communities affect families. And so how are families expected to function adequately without proper support? Um, because we can ask the questions, why do some families do well with the same set of resources and others do not? Um, and so that could do with how we view resilience. Um, do we view it as a trait? Do we view it as a process? And I'll talk about that in, in a second. But more often than not, is we often have to look at the community and look at government and look at social services, look at our health services, look at our education services. We have to ask ourselves, what is the community's or what is society's responsibility towards families and not just families' responsibilities towards society? Um, and unfortunately, is that some conditions just far exceed a family's ability to be resilient. Um, and so, like I said before, is that so we ask the question, okay, so we have two families within the same community and one does really well and one does not. And so, so, so what is that? And so that can also have to do with how we view resilience. Um, and what is it that we expect our families to do and is it fair of us to expect families to do to to do that um, and so if we take a look at what family resilience is is that if we consider it a trait if we consider it innate within people and something that some people are really good at and some people aren't because we see it as this thing that everybody needs to possess or should we look at it as something that 
is a process that's something you can learn and something that can be developed and that's really the, the the angle that i come from and that what i'm saying is that based on my experiences that and you know what not only what i've read um what i've researched uh you know what i've seen is that it really is a process that involves community and family um, the family resilience perspective that my studies often take is that of Walsh's, from Walsh's family resilience theories. And the reason for this is that I find it is a very comprehensive um, theory and that it looks at different processes. So there's three overarching processes and each of those three have three processes as well, which sort of make up these things. So the three big ones is belief systems, organizational processes, communication patterns. And so my, my theory is how do we build this from a, a community perspective? And so a lot of people oftentimes problematize this idea of family resilience because of this idea of, I'm not idea, but very strong reason as to how do we expect people to, to be okay when, when they don't have much to be okay with. And so that does have to do with how you view resilience. But what I'm saying and what Walsh was saying is that resilience, family resilience is a complex, dynamic and interrelated process, right? It has these different elements. And what we need to do is to view it differently. View it as a theory and as a process which can reduce vulnerability in families, which can enhance family functioning, and that can mobilize family and community resources. And if we view it in that way, and we view it as an, as an effective theory, then we can try to use it as an intervention, which can try to enhance these processes um, within families. Sometimes there's not a lot you can do, but what can we do with the little that we are given? So really my family, or the, the family in the more general sense, not my family, um, was really the site for intervention. And, and the rationale is this, is that while gains have been made um, in South Africa uh, specifically by providing access to social and mental health services, there remains a significant lack of resources for much needed community-based services. In rural communities, the situation is, um, is, is worse um, because there's limited access to resources and those resources that they do have access to is often quite costly in order to get to and then to use. Um, so there is a need to develop within family resources. But really what the researchers found is that a community-based approach is often the best way um, to work with families. And so using a community-based approach in intervention development has been, sorry, has been found um, to increase the efficacy of family-based interventions. Um, I'm going to just for two minutes, this is the overview of the study that I was referring to in the beginning when I was talking about my experience in the family research field. Um, and the aim of my study was really to create a family based program, make sure that it was contextually based so that it came from the people um, that it will be of service to and people can access it should they use it. And so there were three, um, three phases of this uh, study was to first identify what needs to be enhanced, then select best practice methods in order to develop um, family-based programs and what has been used, what's been good, what's been useful. And then in actually developing, you know, now we had the, the intervention objectives, we knew some of the best ways to do it, um, but then what is the meat that is going to go into the bones? And so how do we actually develop um, develop that that intervention? What does it look like? And so that formed part of the methodology of the study. So we have this program and the program is called the Family Resilience Strengthening Program. 
through this process, I learned a few lessons. Um, and what were those lessons? The participatory action approach within this umbrella of action research really provided a valuable process approach within this research to encourage community awareness and participation. And so based on the different methods and steps um, that were used, it really did encourage community awareness and, and participation. The project, its methodology provided greater networking of different groupings. So that's what I mean by community awareness and participation. So not only as field workers, because they were used as, um, well, that was terrible to say, but they, uh, the project needed field workers in order to do the door-to-door -door, door -door -door survey of, um, in order to get a sort of a general sense of what are the family resilience needs. And so a lot of that actually brought about a lot of networking, not only between the NGO that, uh, like I said earlier, was my, essentially my gatekeeping to the community, um, but also between the religious forum, the education forum, and, and different social groupings as well, is people started talking to one another through this process of, um, of the survey. For example, one of the field workers said that as a result of the survey, um, they've had new signups to the NGO to participate in some of the groups. Um, another field worker said that even the questions on the survey itself just really opened him, opened his mind up to his family. And what does his family look like? What does his family believe? Uh, believe how does his family talk to one another? Um, uh, at another meeting, um, which was very interesting is we had the NGO and we had the religious forum. We were presenting the results, getting some feedback, engaging in discussions when the religious, some of the religious forums, some of the priests and deacons were saying, well, they are going to put the local NGO's number on the weekly pamphlets that they give or leaflets that they give out at church which is progress, which was growth, because people were talking to one another and not working in silos. So the NGO um, and other stakeholders also received regular feedbacks. We had regular meetings that we, we could discuss things. It wasn't just a feedback info giving session. Um, and what I also realized, and again, this also comes, you know, often only comes in hindsight, unfortunately, is that VAR requires um, the development of a relationship with participants and being conscious of power dynamics that can be created. And unfortunately, sometimes you only see that after, like I mentioned previously, but it's just so important to be conscious of it and to be conscious of the effects that even something as simple, and I say simple, even something as simple as completing a survey um, can do. Uh, it can make people think asking someone a question could change their perspective on something forever. And so it's really important that as researchers, clinicians, practitioners, that whatever our chosen epistemological stance is, whatever our methodology is, is that it needs to be considered very carefully because there are effects that we might not think about at the time, but whatever lessons you learn along the way, document it, make note of it, and use it next time. It's something that I am going to continuously use in my own practices going forward, and especially in my postdoc, because the, the process that I described was actually my PhD study. Um, and now in my postdoc and all the other research projects that I am going to be involved in is something that many, many elements will be considered because these are the kinds of effects that I would like to have. The kinds of effects that I speak to a field worker, somebody that's collaborating with me, um, a participant who then speaks to somebody else, who then speaks to somebody else, and the wave gets bigger and bigger. And so that is our responsibility and that is the message that I would like to give um, today. So I'd like to thank you for listening to my presentation. You're welcome to email me um, and I will get back to you as soon as I can. I thank you.